Okay, let's get going. All right, everyone. Um, let's get ready for an interesting conversation about process improvement in security operations centers. Uh, it's not something that you hear about every day, but honestly, it's something that is exceptionally important. Um, so let's get into this. Uh, all right, so there's three basic things I want to cover here today. Um, one is understand that technology is a piece of the puzzle when improving operations. There is the focus of the technology, the, the actual servers and everything else, and the physical tuning of the applications. Focus on that. I really do. And I want you to look at everything else around it, because that's usually where a lot of your handoff problems are. So next is how to understand your operations through metrics and, and maps, process maps. And the third is how to write a business case that will actually help you get your work prioritized over everyone else's. Um, this is a lot of things I've heard and, and, and learned about over the years. A uh, quick background about myself. Uh, I am a Lean Six Sigma black belt, been doing it for 15 years, have a background in hospitality and uh, microbrewing. So I used to own a uh, microbrewery as well. Uh, lost that hell of an MBA. We won't get into that one right now. Um, but I have done process improvement in a lot of different industries, uh, manufacturing, uh, supply chain, laboratories, um, retail, uh, information technology, back office operations, security operation centers, professional service environments. So I have an idea of how things flow. And there are two constants that I have noticed throughout my career of improving processes. One, people's processes of people's problems are the same wherever you go. The problems you see in a security operations center, believe it or not, are the same you'd experience in manufacturing. And people will always focus on the technology that they know. In manufacturing, it's the machines. In IT, it's the servers or it's the applications. And people forget about the other areas that you got to look at, people and processes. And that's what I really want to highlight here. So what we're going to cover today who can we learn from? The operational problems that we should all be pretty familiar with. Uh, operational complexity, change being difficult, understanding your process, measurement systems, motion in an IT environment, which is going to be interesting, quantifying a problem, and then we'll wrap it up. So about five years ago, I started working in a well-known internet company, uh, one of the backbones of the internet. and. One of the uh, areas I focused on was the professional services world, um, particularly implementing um, denial of service software and applications, and then uh, coincidentally, all of the operations and the security operations downstream from all these uh, for the, these applications. Um, in this particular environment, it was global. There was five different SOCs that we worked with: 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. This was uh, unusual for me, um, and it was unusual for a lot of other groups within this company, namely finance. And if anybody is in a security operations center, you guys are kind of a black box to everyone else in the company. You're not a call center. You are not uh, customer support, although you kind of do both. And then you do all sorts of other things along the way. Makes it interesting, makes it difficult for someone outside of this environment to actually understand it. So how do we get you guys the... Um, uh, the insight and the knowledge to go out and present your case in a different light that will actually make people stand up and take notice beyond the security aspect of it. So, who can we learn from? Uh, this is kind of an eclectic group of people here, to be honest with you. Um, we got Deming, we got Jack Welch, and Vince Lombardi, and I'm sure there's everyone kind of knows Vince Lombardi here, but. Um, the quotes that I pulled out from these guys are actually very telling. If you uh, have gone through the world of process improvement and you kind of have looked at, uh, you know, there's TQM, there was um, Six Sigma, then there was Lean. I've gone through all those and actually I've gotten to the point where I've gone through systems thinking and now I'm looking at the entire end-to-end -end -end process, but it's about the basics. Everything goes back to the basics. And that was a theme that was hit on on several other uh, presentations a little while back. So what Deming's saying here, if you can't describe what you are doing as a process, you don't know what you are doing, period. I have, can't tell you how many times I have come across managers who kind of know what's going on, but kind of don't. And it's the kind of don't world that gets you into a lot of trouble when things start to go sideways. And so if you look at Jack Welch, 
an organization's ability to learn and translate that into learning rap action rapidly is the ultimate competitive advantage. That is tremendous because if you don't learn from your mistakes, not just, I'm, I'm talking about the, oh, we, we almost brought the network down type of thing where we have to put in six more checks. If you don't learn from your little mistakes, you're never going to learn at all. You're, gonna, you're at status quo, period. Never going to get any better. And then Vince Lombardi was kind of interesting. I've been reading up on him. And uh, one of the things that uh, he had said when he first became coach of the Packers uh, in the early 60s, was, he was, uh, one of the reporters had challenged him and said, well, what are you going to do to help us out? Uh, the team hadn't been doing well for the last decade, and people were getting really, uh, really upset with that. And honestly, he said, I'm not going to change anything. We'll use the same players, the same training system, and we're going to concentrate on becoming brilliant at the basics. Go back to the basics. That's all it is. And from there, once you become brilliant at the basics, now you can start to become great at what you're doing. So that's going to become a theme overall. All right, from uh, an audience participation perspective, if anybody has any other um, operational problems that they want to throw out, please feel free to. Um, these are all the same from manufacturing and any other labs and uh, supply chain warehouses that I've been in. Um, slightly different problems, but generally the same. So in this case, first bullet there, overloaded teams. This is a big problem uh, in the socks that I saw. Uh, we'll look at how we can measure overloading a, uh, a team looks like in a, in a few minutes. But um, in this case, you have burnout. You have people that are leaving. And there's all sorts of reasons for that, but primarily it's, it's the stress of the job. You know, tier one, tier two type support, pretty intense. Um, second, we have uh, customer complaints about speed and quality. You didn't get to my stuff fast enough. You don't, you, you put my, uh, you, you screwed up my data. You didn't call the right person. You sort of sent this email. Those are problems that we want to be looking at. That's bad. That's going to result in customer churn uh, or your senior executives are going to be out on the apology tour. Always happens. Um, incorrect code getting pushed out onto a network. Ouch. I've seen that happen several times. Only several times. It's usually beat the crap out of people when that happens, and you learn pretty quickly. But there's, there's reasons for all, you know, why that happens. Um, budget challenges. We need to grow. Uh, traffic's getting worse. Um, hacking, uh, the uh, denial of service attacks never really let up. I, you know, the people who are going after all these other companies don't really care about your budgets or anything else like that. So the companies want to spend money on resources? Well, all right, you got a problem. How do you do it more with what you have? Um, risk and compliance concerns, another big problem. Um, and then we also have misleading or partial me incomplete metrics. These are a big problem. And then lack of training. Maybe you don't have enough training uh, or not the right training. Uh, and then ultimately, too many tickets, uh, too many systems and or older technology that you have to replace and you don't have the budget for it, whatever it may be. I've seen that happen plenty of times and that's a big problem. So how do you get around that? And we'll, we'll actually come back to that. Um, so before we go on, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually weave several of my uh, stories of my experiences with uh, security operations centers and improving them throughout these slides. And it'll help me give some context to what's going on here. I've seen a lot of these problems. Um, so one of the things that we're really going to um, we'll look at in a second is the operational complexity. But before we really uh, get into all that, the, just to give you a bit of background on the SOC work that I did. So about three years ago, I set foot into my first SOC. Um, it was um, down in Fort Lauderdale, and there was uh, probably 150 people or so in there. Uh, Kind of scary because I had never been in a SOC. I don't know how to improve processes in a SOC. And the uh, senior director said to me, "You know what, Mark? I don't think you're going to find any problems here. We have we just improved all of our technology. We have some new stuff that we're working on, and the team is working great. We have every one of our processes documented. We have great metrics. Oh boy! All right, what am I going to do? So." Um, Sat down and there is just started working on things. Basically, what you're trained to do in, uh, in lean manufacturing is you observe. More than anything else, you just sit and watch things. And that's one of the things that Toyota used to train their managers still do. They actually tell you to stand in one spot and watch a machine. And they'll come back to you several hours later and say, what you learned. You're supposed to be able to translate what the machine is doing and then be able to explain how you would improve it. Now. 
everyone knows this is security operations centers are not manufacturing environments, although they operate like them. You don't see the waste. You don't see the activity. You just see people looking at screens. So the real stuff that's happening is behind the screen. And I'm really nervous. And I sat down and said, all right, let's look at your metrics. What do you got? And they said, oh, we got these great metrics. Look at all this stuff. We measure all of our uh, six, uh, mitigations. And we have a 99.9% .9 success rate with our attack mitigation. Great. What else do you got? Oh, we have all these other technical things that we measure. That's awesome. What about your process? Do you guys have any productivity? Do you know if you're overstaffed or you're understaffed or if your teams are, uh, has to have too much work or anything like that? No, we don't know how to measure that. So we kind of walked away from that. Okay. Do you look at anything for your people? Do you look at um, skill sets or anything else like that? Nope. We, we don't know how to do that. But we kind of track stuff off to the side if people are turning over. So do you have a turnover problem? Yes, we do. Okay. So still not knowing what I'm going to improve. And I was given free reign of the entire SOC. Do my process mapping. We've got people participating in the event. And we're learning about some stuff that's going on. But I'm still missing it. So the next few slides will kind of tell us how I, I um, learned what was going on. So in the book, Chasing the Rabbit uh, by Steven Spear, if anybody ever gets a chance to read it, please do. It's really interesting. Um, it's about how uh, organizations learn from their mistakes versus organizations that don't learn from their mistakes. And one of the things they looked at, there are several case studies that Steven Spear did. Uh, one was the Three Mile Island nuclear meltdown. For those who are old enough, I think uh, there's a few of us in the audience that are um, old enough to remember that, but that was pretty intense at the time. Um, and then um, the Challenger explosion, that was another one he looked at. And then there was another scenario with um, someone getting killed in a hospital. Simple mistake, they got the wrong medicine at the wrong time. At 3 o'clock in the morning, a nurse was tired, grabbed the, the wrong medicine, and injected it in the person, and the person died. So then they go in and he looks at the other side of the equation, which is what are the companies that actually learn from the mistakes? Alcoa is one. Uh, they have the best safety record in, uh, I think they're better than uh, the accounting industry, believe it or not, than their aluminum forge. Uh, they they um, forge aluminum. Uh, and then obviously Toyota and there's several uh, nuclear, uh, the, the U.S. Naval Nuclear Reactor Program is the other one that he looked at. But in this case, uh, I picked this one because this really is the closest thing to a uh, security operations center or a normal business, right? This is complexity at its greatest. And in the case that of the Three Mile Island nuclear meltdown, the, when they really went through the whole process of understanding what went wrong, doing the root cause analysis, th what, was really st what stood out to the people who were doing it was what, it's not what went wrong, it was what didn't go wrong. There were some major things that didn't go wrong. Things were actually working correctly. So no critical component failed. No sabotage. No one was out there with a vendetta against the, uh, the operation. And every system functioned as designed. What was happening was there's too many alarms that were going off. The system was functioning as designed. And they were just used to that. The operators were used to just turning things off because people were going to take care of it later on. It was just too many alarms. Overload. That's when things start getting complex. And then when you start to look at your management. So let's transfer this over to your current situation, your security operations centers. Those things are really complex. Talking to is different people having different things going on. Um, you have to get permissions from. You have all sorts of network events going on. Uh, servers may fail. Scrubbers may go down. All those things are going on at once, and everyone has to fix stuff. So this is complexity. And ultimately, how do you get back from the complexity? How do you boil that down to the basics? And one thing about Toyota, and I'll, I'll be jumping around and kind of highlighting back and forth, uh, highlighting Toyota here and there, is Toyota always looks for clear lines of communication between every handoff point. Clear lines of communication means it's kind of binary more than anything else. Yes, no, I got this, I don't have it. Everything has to be clear. So what we're trying to look at in, in the SOC is how do you actually break down your most complex processes and really focus on the basics. And what this does, and this is why I keep saying, focus on the stuff around the technology, not on the technology itself. The technology you guys will always focus on, that's great. You need to bring on that new stuff. You need to keep up with all the uh, technological advances that the hackers have. You guys got to function on your own within the operation and around the technology. That is the challenge, and it's really hard to do. So 
how do we change? Change is exceptionally difficult uh, in any organization that I've ever been part of. Um, security is the same. And one of the things that, uh, going back through the, my experiences in the SOC, um, one of the things that I really had to do was get people on board with what I was doing right away. And while everyone was really open to me, very supportive, it was great to have you on board, but we have all sorts of problems. No one really told me what was going wrong. But what I had to do was get them to believe that there was a need for change. Once I got them hooked on that, I didn't even go in with any tools or anything. I just had to get them talking about their problems. And once we got the problems out in the open and we started to figure out how to show them and highlight them, we started to fight some battles for them outside, you know, within the organization, but outside of the SOC, that's when things started to change. That's when I gained their trust. That, believe it or not, is change management. That's not the, oh, we're going to go out, you have some great change happening here, we're going to communicate to you. No, I got to sit down next to you, kind of got to sweat with you, do your job, understand your job, so that I can go help you change. So we all know if you go upstream, people don't care about what you're doing. You go downstream, people don't care about what you're doing. They just want their own little, uh, you need to present something to me the way I want it. And most of the time, you don't get what you want. That's the problem. So how do we go fix that? It's those little breakdowns in communication that is where your that that's really where the money is for improving your operations. It's not you know you're not going to improve the millisecond the, trans, the, the total number of milliseconds in a transaction. That's that's useless. You want to take the minutes or the the the, the, uh, the hours around the, uh, the the whole transaction out of the picture and focus on just the value. So. This is, really, this is really tough to do, and yes, I struggled within the company I was in to make change uh, happen. So what we did, um, we'll, we'll get to actually what I did after uh, the next slide, but this guy, uh, Kurt Lewin, is really what I would consider the godfather, so to speak, of change management. And he had this process, this is back in the 40s and 50s, and his, his approach to change management was creating the perception that change was needed. It's not like we're going to go in and tell you that change has to be done. We already know that change has to be done. Everybody knows it. No one knows how to go about doing it. So let's go figure out how to make people embrace change. What are the problems? And let's just go focus on those. And whoever has heard about you know, the, the Six Sigma projects that you know save millions of dollars, I could care less than that. That stuff doesn't really work because in three months, you've slid back to where you were originally or worse. In this case, I want the little things. I want to get you guys engaged in the process. Let's solve, let's, let's standardize, let's, let's, let's standardize run books or anything else that might, this a stupid little thing, the basics, that's what I want to be focusing on because that's going to help you guys just a little bit each day. So in Kurt Lewin's world, you create the perception that change is needed. You move toward the new desired level of behavior. So you, you go do all your work. Then you actually you get people on board. Then you go do the change. And then you solidify that. Now, continuous improvement brings you right back to the first. Go to the next and keep repeating this. And the more people get used to seeing things happen and get embrace the change because you're actually focusing on them, the more you're going to learn, the more you're going to do, and the more things you're going to, uh, the, the more success you'll see. So how do you go about doing this? And there is, a, we're going to show you a turtle diagram. Uh, believe it or not, this is a quick way of understanding your process. We'll get more into this in the next slide. But um, this is, uh, believe it or not, it's an auditor's tool. I was uh, I am a lead auditor. I've passed my certifications for 9001 and 27001. And this is that they actually give you in, the, uh, in your training class. So what this does, this is a great little graphic here. Um, your process is the turtle body itself. And then you have inputs, which are the head, the outputs, which are the, the tail, so what do you deliver. And then what you do is you have your resources, your, um, your methods, and who they are, what they are, and what are your measures. And literally in 10 minutes, if I sat there listening to you describe your process, I could actually pick out exactly what's going on in your process, where your gaps are, and as an auditor, I'd figure out where I want to go and audit. So pretty scary what you can find out in 10 minutes. So when we start looking at the, um, just let me back up and give you a different story here. So one of the areas I was focusing on uh, also in this company was um, the technical, um, technical services group. These guys were the technical engineers. And so they were um, out there with the sales reps and 
uh, trying to put together all the um, various demos and stuff that were going on, help sell the product. And then they had to go back into the world of implementation and, and professional services and actually get these uh, the application stood up and running. And people came to me, all right, you're the process guy, help us understand, we want to map our processes. Waste of time, forget it. I'm going to give everybody one of these. And we're going to go through the process, each one of their process, and they're going to fill it out. And one of the, the biggest takeaway they had was, we really don't know what we're doing. We know individually what we are doing, but we don't know what the upstream and downstream processes need. And you know what? We don't have any measures. And you know what? We don't even know who we're sending stuff to half the time. Okay, great. We at least know where to go. That was it. So simple questions will get you a lot of distance. So this is a little bit, um, this is a better version of the same diagram. So what you can see here is there's a little bit more information around here. So once again, your process, four to seven steps, no decision points at all, high level. I get something, I do these four things to it, and I send it out. That's it. We don't really need to know the details around that. Inputs, literally this could be your requirements for something. If you're building something or you're doing something, uh, in a security operations center, it could be a triage process. It could be a, um, a tier two where a specialist is actually looking at how do you mitigate an attack. Um, whatever the inputs are, you list them here. Whatever the outputs are, it could be um, a phone call to the customer. It could be an email to an internal customer. It doesn't matter what it is, a um, successfully mitigated attack. That's okay. You get to document stuff in a run book or wherever else it needs to go, put it there. That's great. This is probably the biggest um, area you really want to focus on, um, the measures. Measures, this is really hard to do in a security environment. It's a really hard to, even harder to do with software developers uh, on their own. But there are ways to actually go about doing this. So this is one area that we're going to focus on heavily in a minute. And then down here we have the how um, support processes. These are people you may want to interact with at, uh, at times. You have to... Um, you may need someone to stand something up or stand an application up or um, do some analysis for you, whatever it may be. You kind of list them up here. So you basically, you can describe your entire process on this one page. Really effective. I added these two boxes in here on either side because this is where problems are. If anyone's ever been part of a process mapping event and you see the, uh, you have the big brown paper up on the wall and you have your yellow sticky notes and maybe there's some pink sticky notes in there for pain points, wherever you see the pain points is at each one of these handoffs always happens. That's because everybody works in their little environments and they're, they're, I focus on this and I need to do this. And damn those people upstream, damn those people downstream, no one ever, don't they understand what I do? This is why we want to do this. We can actually go and start talking to people and understand what they need. This is where your delays come. It's not necessarily in the world that you're in here, although it does sit in this world because you got to stop and go back and get stuff or someone's got to bother you, you have to go get something for someone else. That's the delays. That's the wait time that we all feel. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So once again, straightforward. You can actually just take this and run with this tomorrow or Monday when you get back to the office and just start filling this out. It's really crazy what you're going to find. So... One of the things I get, one of the questions I've gotten over the years is how many, you know, how, how do you measure time in a process? This is interesting because there's actually three clocks in a process. People don't know that, but um, there is, we try to measure this, the, the, cent the center one here, the cycle time. That's what we try to measure. That's, you know, transaction in and out. Right? That's easy. But we forget about lead time. Lead time is time into a queue through the time it leaves your process. Transaction's done. That never shut, that clock doesn't, never stops. You never turn it off until it leaves the process. This is what the customer feels. You guys go get a cup of coffee and you're waiting in line, there's 20 people there. Oh, you're gonna wait a while. That's what you feel. After like 10 minutes, you're getting, a, you kind of get antsy. That's it. How do you improve that? This is queuing theory. You guys probably learned this for all your servers and stuff like that and transactions. This is it in real life. So we go into the cycle time, the time into the process. It comes out of the queue, and you guys start working it, and, you, um, and then you hand it off. Clock never stops. This, the activity time, if you have to start and stop, start and stop, start and stop, that's it. The clock is on and off, on and off for however long it takes. 
most of the time, your transaction, the actual activity time, takes no more than several minutes. I'll give you an hour max. This could be several hours. This could be days, weeks, or months, believe it or not. So customer feels this. We try to measure this. We think this is what the cycle time is, but it's not. And we are trying to, uh, we're trying to fix the time into the process and, time into, uh, and the lead time of the process. That's what we're focusing on. I don't want to touch this. This is your, the work you're doing. So, we're tr so ultimately, when we get to the next slide, you know, we're going to figure out how do we go about solving stuff. Let's get into the metrics part of this. Technology is always measured. This is your uh, denial of service attack, you know, successfully mitigated attacks. There might be some other things that you're measuring here. It's easy. You guys know it. You can grab it. That's what, don't stop, please. Keep going with that. That's really important. But this, these two at the bottom here, the people and process, so people, process, technology. Technology is covered. People and process usually aren't. And we usually get some crazy stuff in process and crazy stuff in people that doesn't make sense. And I want to try and help you. Um, I use some uh, case studies here, um, case studies, real life uh, uh, scenarios for how we address both of these. Well, actually, more process than people. People was, uh, was difficult to do, admittedly. So first thing we're going to look at is, OK, OK, All right. OK, perfect. Um, First thing I did in the world in the SOC that I was at was come up with a uh, global capacity chart. So this is this was out of a need that we had. Finance wanted to potentially um, uh, reduce the headcount in the SOC, you know, all the SOCs, because the model that they were using was for customer support, and that's a different model than what a SOC is. So, honest, what I did was um, I said, "Look, guys, I I think you're, I, I think they're way off." And there's a couple things that we're going to do here. I'm going to take a page out of an industrial engineer's handbook. This is like literally coming out of manufacturing. And I'm going to sit here and I'm going to figure out every one of your transactions. In this world, we used um, Salesforce as our system of record. So it was easy to grab the stuff. You can still grab transactions out of uh, any other system you guys may have. Just don't worry about Salesforce being the system of record here. And we looked at the headcount. We looked at all of the transactions that could possibly be in Salesforce for them. And then there was other things that happened outside that were not part of Salesforce, They're not like legitimate transactions they tracked, but they were activities they did. We are taking everything. So in this case, um, let's kind of go over the, the chart here, and then we'll, we'll get into what we found with this. So here we have, uh, there's a red line, there's a, gr a gray line, and then there's a green line. So red line is a theoretical max of, num of staff, basically. Number of hours available on any given uh, week. This is budgeted headcount. These are people that were showing up every day. So taking a utilization rate, we'll get into details in a minute. This is, uh, there was still legitimately another 30% of labor that sat on top of it. But um, So this was the red line. We don't want to necessarily go above that. When we do, we're kind of, we're, we're in the process of really stressing people out. And then the gray line is hours consumed. This literally was a query that pulled all these transactions out. We added them all up. We had uh, uh, minutes ne uh, next to each one of these transactions. Divide them by 60. Yes, we sat there and timed everybody, or we used guesstimates as best we can. This was not as precise as we wanted it to be, but it still was good enough for, for us at the time. The green line, the dotted line there, was there for a reason. Whenever you build a process, maybe you design a process, you always want to know where the 80% is. That's where you want to keep your, uh, your machines running at, your people running at. The reason why you want that is because you have the distance between the green line and the red line, that extra 20% of capacity. That's what you want there for when you have a big event that takes place at the, at the very end there. That's what you're trying to look for. So the green line really doesn't mean much other than it's, it's the way to see where you are with things. So this is over a course of a year, 2017, and at the end you can see we have uh, we had a split week, and so we really didn't have much traffic. Christmas week and the or New Year's week and the week after, so it was kind of a kind of a screwy uh, time of the year. So I actually should have taken that out. But um, if you look at this, you can kind of say that you know there there is a slight upward slope with activity, and um, here we're actually doing pretty well. We're staffed the right way, and 
this is actually for all the socks we had. This is five socks that we looked at. Uh, we got this on, we, I generated this on a monthly basis. Now, once you get up, like when I see this, that's okay. I'm not, not concerned about that. It's down here. Your eyes go to that. What the heck happened? What was going on? Um, on a, there were two things that happened. One was Krebs. That's part of that big uh, bump there. And the other was some uh, tremendous network traffic that was going on at that time of Q4. Um, and when I ran this, um, I remember calling the director up, uh, senior director up, and I said, uh, Roger, what are you, are you guys like stressed out? Is everyone shaking? He's like, yeah. He's like, well, how do you know that? I'm like, I'm going to send you this slide. And he looked and he's like, yeah, son of a gun. That's exactly what's going on. So what we did here, so th once, we, once we pulled all this together, we started validating, once it was validated, we got out in front of finance, and finance said, what are you doing? Ours is better than yours. The more we took our, both of the capacity plans apart, we realized that they were only capturing 50% of all the transactions that were going on. And they're basing headcount off of that. Now we came back with this and said, here, we have 15 transactions here. This is how we're pulling it. This is what you should be doing. And they, they came back and said, you know what, guys? You're right. We're taking this. We're going to run with this going forward. That's transformation. Now the SOC has just gained some massive credibility. And people all the way up to the CEO had no idea how to measure, true, really truly measure capacity here. Now they do. And no, this isn't precise, but it's a heck of a lot better than where we're at. And I don't think you ever actually need to be as precise as like a, a manufacturing environment. As long as you kind of know where you are with staffing and stuff, that's all you really want to see. So um, just a quick um, background on the, the nuts and bolts and stuff that sits behind there. Um, for those that haven't done this before, it's going back to the basics. It's really saying, uh, how many people do you have on? And you work 40 hours a week. Everyone does, uh, for the most part. Uh, even the socks with their split weeks, they still work 40 hours a week. And one of the things we had to figure out was the utilization rate. And for those that don't know it, it's you don't work at your desk eight hours a day, although sometimes it does feel that way. Maybe you do. Um, maybe you work more than that at times. But um, the wind is kind of making this a little difficult here. But um, what we're trying to do, what everyone looks at from a staffing perspective is, you're not at your when they say you're not at your desk for 30 percent of your 30 percent of your day, you got to go to the bathroom, you got to eat lunch, you're going to go to meetings, you're going to do training, you do all sorts of stuff that is not customer specific. That's this is just a general rule of thumb. 70 percent is what they were um, this particular company was using. I've seen it go in different uh, groups up to like 80 percent, 75, 80 percent. So you're working, um, you're at your desk 80 percent of the time, and ultimately what we do is. Um, you add up all your hours per per day per week, and you're going to have you're going to get to a number of large amount a num large amount of hours. And um, once you figure out what that is, you take your thirty percent of it. That becomes your steady line. And you can see when this line is you know, starting to come up a little here, and then it jumps there. That's when they hired more people. So it actually shows up in your in your charts. So all in Excel. Coming out of Salesforce, I think we used Access for a little while to do some chunking uh, the data, and then ultimately we sat in uh, in Excel. So very useful. This is the same model, but broken down for a, one of the individual socks. This is the larger one. That one's just, uh, the prior slide was actually the um, all five socks that were in there. And this you can see there's a lot more variation in the hours consumed. And once again, they were pretty stable for the first part of the, the year. We, I have no problem with uh, the bumps here. And they started getting busy, middle of the year. And then towards the end, there was a bunch of things that happened. Who remembers Hurricane Irma? That's it. So this particular sock was offloading their work to other socks. And if you look at the other ones, I don't have them in this, uh, in this presentation, you'd see a corresponding uptick in the work that was coming there. So it was all the alerts and work that was getting passed along. And once again, this was the uh, in Krebs and, um, and some other major network events that were going on there. So very interesting stuff. So this answered the question for them. Yeah, we're we're pretty much um, we're we're pretty well staffed. We may need to do more. Um, and now this provides provides the case going forward when they do their budgets for the following year. I, I don't know if they got any more or not, but um, they could ask for more headcount because at least they have the data. So that's great. But what about productivity? How do we measure that? That was a challenging, very challenging problem. So this was, uh, we had to get really creative about this. And we, we sat down and we, we really knocked this one around for a while. And the challenge is that we had 
20, 15 different managers that were running teams globally, 24 by 7, five different socks, multiple uh, senior managers. And one thing we did know was that everything was, uh, they all followed the same process. That was one of the things they were actually really good at. And tier one, tier two, everybody followed the same process for the most part. And in this case, this is for tier one, this is the triage uh, portion of the work. So these guys are getting slammed day in and day out. And we started, we said, all right, let's look at it, if it's all about alert acknowledgement, because that kept coming up in all of our conversations. We got to acknowledge an alert. All right, let's work with alert acknowledgements. We had to take the data, we had to really peel it apart. We had to use multiple data sets, from multiple data sources. And what we did was uh, we looked at an average um, acknowledgement rate within five minutes. We thought that was a wide enough range for people to work within. And it technically should be a lot tighter than that, but we, we went there. And then we looked at the average acknowledgements per technician per hour over a 40-hour week or whatever week they were working. So um, the way we read this chart, once we, uh, the 70% line was arbitrary. That was me saying, all right, I don't want to start at 90 or 95%. I want to be, let's do something nice. Let's just be at 70%. It's, it seems like it's a lot more attainable when we first start this off. So the way we read this chart, this is uh, the bottom two. This is low volume. Low acknowledgement rate. We're not acknowledging things quickly. Bottom right, high volume. We're not acknowledging things quickly. This is the level you kind of want to be looking at. You want everybody up. Top left, top right. Top left is this is uh, we're low volume, but we're acknowledging things fast. And top right is high volume, and we're acknowledging things fast. And so when you come out here, you can see we're at like three alerts per hour. And there was, we realized later on that we weren't capturing all of the alerts, but um, we came back and fixed that. But if you look at, if you look at that, there's only a couple of groups that were actually doing pretty well. Everyone else is kind of out here, and it, it also it's this, a scatter plot. Look at a shotgun blast, and everything is kind of just pretty random. And most of the stuff is sitting, you know, in this area right here. This isn't bad. This is not good, and that isn't good. So. We're going to go back to change management now. This is what Kurt Lewin was talking about earlier, which is create the perception that change is needed. Now, this wasn't the full way I'd like to do it, but you know what? It was very effective. So we worked with, we went out with the managers, uh, the senior level leaders first. We said, hey, look, let's, let's try this out. We don't know if this is going to work. Don't use it to um, judge anybody's at the end of the year or anything like that. Let's just validate and make sure this works. And the managers used it. They're like, they started asking questions of each other. Well, why is your team um, up top and my team is down here? How do you have your staff set up? And in the, the, uh, tier one was set up with three guys on the uh, uh, doing triage for alerts, answering phones and emails and stuff. And tier two was off on their own as well. And this is primarily tier one guys. And they started figuring out that some guys, some managers had people on their phones, uh, had, a, had one person dedicated to phones and two guys dedicated on alerts, and they were able to transfer. They were starting to figure out how to improve this on their own without me even going in and starting, you know, hitting them with tools or anything like that. That's change management. Now, let's go, let's fast forward to the third quarter of the year and look at the difference of the dots. People were actually using this, the managers in all their one-on-ones, uh, -on when they went in with the senior leaders, the senior leaders had this. This went out every week. And they said, oh, why, what's going on with your shift? Oh, I, I, I had lost a guy, whatever it may be. But all of a sudden, they started paying attention to what was going on. They're pushing people to actually figure out what the problems are, and they're addressing them. That's what we're looking for. So when you get back to your complaint, we talked about the complaints earlier. You're not fast enough. You're not doing the right thing. Well, guess what? Now we are getting fast enough. We didn't quite get to the point, this, this actually shifted, but it, they wanted to move the bar up even further to 80 or 90% when, uh, when I was there. So that's really good. So here, we still wanted to look at productivity. This is, I, I left this in, this was a, uh, one of the charts that we did. It's a massive amount of data that we were able to grab from Salesforce and several other areas that actually showed us what was going on. And this was done in Excel, and I left the, the Excel filters in there on purpose because it's, um, these are all the different filters that we can do. Uh, we, we could have um, pr uh, we provided for them. But in this case, this is one particular manager, and he has um, five guys, I believe. I think each one of these, um, actually, has three different um, uh, technicians in each one of these weeks. 
And we just looked at this. I left it up like that because the data pattern is really interesting. And look at the high bars, and then you look at the low bars. I said, hey, what's going on here? And this guy, uh, this great guy, I was actually very friendly with him, is just slapping alerts down, and he's getting credit for it. And the guys down here were getting the heavy stuff. So, oh, all of a sudden, let's, well, this particular manager say, you, you may want to, like, talk to them and find out, like, figure out what's going on here, use this, and let's see if you can start to tighten this up. And it started to tighten up a little down there, but now all of a sudden, they could see what was going on. Really interesting stuff. And we can go by cases, like these cases, they can do product, we can do whatever they wanted within the, uh, the filters here. This was really, this is really interesting. Um, so now let's go one step further. So this is time to respond. I, I blanked out that particular part. I didn't want to give away anything here. But um, once again, we're managing, we're measuring how the, the manager's teams are doing overall for acknowledgement of a particular type of uh, alerts. And so the red line there is 70%. We just kind of use that as a visual uh, line of demarcation just to figure out where we are. And you can see alert volume on the left side, left axis, y axis, and then the percent within uh, acknowledged within seven minutes on, a, on the far right axis. And this is beginning of the month, so we had a lot of data missing here. But um, you can see that everyone's doing pretty well here. And in that case, there was an anomaly. Um, there was just nothing going on, and they screwed up. They literally did. They forgot to acknowledge. They left the alerts hang out there for too long. So that brought their per uh, that percentage down. But the senior managers were actually talking about that. What happened? Oh, yeah, these guys were, we, we got sidetracked with something else. We had to go fix it. Now, it won't, won't happen anymore. That's what we're looking for. So this gives you an idea that it is possible to actually come up with some meaningful metrics in a security operations center and something that's really going to have some impact on, on the world around you. So next, we're going to talk about how do we look at motion in, in a security operations center. And I just happened to rip this map off, uh, off the, the web last night. And I didn't have anything really effective to use. but. Um, this is, you probably have seen these types of maps, swim lane map, and BAs and project managers love them. Hey, this is my process, right? No. This is what it is on a good day. We don't, we're missing a lot of things here. We're missing the motion. We're missing cycle time. We're missing lead time. We're missing activity time. We're missing problems. We're missing a lot of things. How many people do I have in here? How many transactions are going through here? What's the throughput rate like? These are all important things that this doesn't show you but this is what gets used. That's the problem. So yeah, I have a map. This is my process. Isn't this great? No. So let's figure out um, what the next, uh, a different version of the same map. This was an actual, I don't know if anybody has been part of a um, process mapping event in the past, but this was one we did um, for a, um, a process improvement event there. And uh, it was for an implementation for a, a DDoS prevention software. And um, so in this case, you can kind of make out the yellow, the yellow sticky notes there. And then you have blue right below that is just some information that was sitting there that they needed to know. And then the orange and the pink were all the pain points. Now we're getting somewhere. Now we have something to work on. We still don't know uh, the cycle time and throughput. We knew that off to the side. We had done all the work ahead of time. And we also had worked on uh, different standardizing phases for it. But still doesn't tell us what's really going on. What the hell is this? That's probably what you're asking, right? Um, this is actually a spaghetti map. Uh, this is uh, something that's uh, come right out of manufacturing. And what you do in manufacturing is you have a floor plan, and you would sit there and you trace the guy's steps as he walks around getting things to go back and forth. And ultimately, what you're trying to do is highlight where he's going, and you want to move all those, prop all those materials that he needs closer to him so he doesn't have to walk any, uh, a great distance. So in this case, IT doesn't have the same type of motion that a manufacturing environment does, but this is motion in an IT environment. This is what we know about. These are the email, this is the email explosion that you guys live every day. So every one of these lines here, actually the, the circles are all actors who are involved in it. This is a particular sales transaction, believe it or not. And the black lines are the CC people, people on the CC line. And the red line is all that we're looking for. That's the approval. This is crazy. This was a competitive situation um, in the company we were at. And the sales rep, it's, I think it took us seven days to get an answer to this. And you say, why? 
What do you need that everybody else has to be part of? This whole thing probably took 15 minutes to answer, but it wasted people's days, right? It filled up their email boxes. And the blue over here, that was for a trial. It took us four days to do that. We're debating the price. Really, shouldn't we just standardize what that is and just go out and do it? Let's go get this stuff rather than, let's build this stuff rather than go and debating it. That's what this is. So this is motion. So if we're just gonna go back to two, two slides here. Motion is not here. You don't see this stuff. This is the things, this, to me, if you ask, if you ask me, this, is, uh, this chart will give you the technical debt that you're, you guys know about. This will give you all those extra uh, databases that hang off here, um, the Excel spreadsheets and uh, other access databases with all the other information. That's what this gets you. This is what life really is. Now we're gonna do one more. So this was actually recent. This is, um, this is uh, a customer trying to get, um, they're trying to have a question answered about when something's actually gonna be done for them, a particular code package run or something like that. And it turns out that there was a problem back here between this group and this group about whose role that was and what was, who was supposed to um, supply the information. And it turned out this took them like two months to actually figure out and the customer escalated. And we're also, we were a uh, recurring revenue situation. This two months of delay actually delayed the project. So that's two months of recurring revenue that we didn't get. That's, that's bad. This is, a pain, this is a pain point. This is not seen in your, uh, on the process maps. This is the stuff that goes on day in and day out. A BA or a, T, a, T, a project manager um, will never, ever see this stuff. This is the pain that you guys live. This is why we want to go look at and understand your process. We want to go do the turtle maps. What are your problems? That's what's going to solve for this. So in this case, blue is an indirect conversation. That's the CC, uh, people on the CC line. And then red is the actual um, uh, people on the two line. So really, really painful. So. So how do we actually quantify this and get you guys the world that you, you know, get the, um, the solutions you need, whether it's more headcount, better technology, um, new programs, whatever it may be. And there's about a, a, it's all about data, believe it or not. It's about how you tell the story. Most people in the technology world and actually every other world that I've been in really don't understand how to tell the story of their, of their problem. And that's what puts things down. So that's what slow th slows things down. The, um, the story I will tell here is I was first week at the SOC trying to figure stuff out and I'm observing. I'm watching the tier one technicians. And one of the things I noticed, there were two things I noticed that day, uh, the third or fourth day, was tier one guys were shaking, literally. These guys were, were doing this. They were just slammed with work. It was one of their busier times. And then the tier two guys were really calm. And I said to one of the senior managers, like, Something's not right here. You guys, your staffing is off or something like that. So that got us into a whole other topic. But the other thing I, I realized was motion. And it was the hops between multiple systems to gather information simply to create an email and send it to the customer. That was the goal. We had a, everything that came in. The customer had to be notified. So we went through this. It was about 10 minutes. I'm sitting there watching my watch going, wait a second. 10 minutes? To do an email, yeah, did it for like six different people. I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm pretty confident with what I'm, I'm seeing here. Senior director comes over and says, what are you thinking, Mark? I was like, how many of these do you get, or these alerts do you get per month globally? He's like, oh, 3,500. 3,500 times 10 minutes divided by six. What's your fully loaded at global average hourly rate? Threw out a number. Wow, okay. Times 12, because we're only looking at a month. I was like, congratulations, you spend about $600,000 a year sending emails. Is that what you want? Is that good? And he went, no, that's not good. VP comes over, we start talking, I was, I'm friendly with him, and he's, uh, he said, all right, here's the backstory. So we had put in for a request uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, to get these systems removed. And our, um, the, the powers that be decided, no, there's more things, things more important. We're gonna focus on that stuff. We're not gonna focus on your systems. And so it was deprioritized, completely off the list. And all of a sudden, we come in with a business case that says, we're spending $600,000 to create emails. This is what's cost. This is cost of business. This is why you can't get anything done, because you're spending all this money going after stupid stuff, the basics. So now, 
word goes out. And sure enough, people, I get challenged, and I'm in IT, I was getting challenged, well, how did you, you know, how'd you come up with a $600,000 number? That was very simple. Here's the volume of stuff, here's the, uh, here's the timings that I did, and we just took the global average hourly rate, and we calculated this. Oh, okay. All right, month later, ratcheted right up to the top, and then two months later, they actually had the project started. That's how fast that went. So. It's really, it's really effective. Now, I was just kind of looking back here, create the perception that change is needed. You argue with data, people are gonna have a hard time arguing back. That's what we're gonna talk about next. So I put a wordy business case up here. Actually, it's like only several sentences, but this is something that I would write, something along the lines. I left the, uh, there's variables in here, X's and Y's and Z's and stuff. Um, we would put whatever numbers that would be in there, but um, so let me read this for you. So. XYZ operation is a customer-facing process that provides critical services to the parent company or, or paying, sort of, uh, paying customers, doesn't matter what it is. It has seen an increase in volume of X percent over the last year while staffing levels have remained steady. Additionally, an X, an X percent increase in customer complaints has been seen over the last year primarily due to slow response time and other quality problems. As a result of slow response time, Y customers have churned this year resulting in Y dollars of lost revenue. It currently takes X minutes to create an email to send to a customer, which translates into Y thousands of dollars of, of hours of labor capacity per year and Z dollars in fully loaded labor costs. Done. You've pretty much outlined your problem here. There is financial impact, there's customer impact, there is labor impact, there's capacity impact, and you know what? I didn't solution anything either. That's all supporting down, down below. I didn't even bother going into that. but. Now you have capacity models. You would be able to quantify your emails. You can look at your, um, your spaghetti charts. You can show all these things. You can outline the number of systems they touch. It's all there. If you go and you start looking at your bugs and anything else like that, do the same thing. Look at your motion. Quantify stuff. It's basic, basic timing. Uh, you look at your cycle times, your activity times. And if you can show uh, an increase in it, and, you know, increase in throughput, decrease, increase in quality, uh, decrease in customer uh, complaints, you're done. That's it. So, in summary, um, just wanted to wrap this up real fast. So, honestly, it's focus on the process, focus on communication. Don't really go to the, the technology unless it is the technology. Just look at everything else around that. Um, walk the transactions if you can. Take something, take your, um, your um, turtle diagram, walk upstream. Hey, we notice you're getting a lot, of, are we helping you out? Are we doing the right thing? Go downstream, hey, are we providing the information you're needing? Can we help you out? Can you tell us what's going on? You do that, guarantee you, you're gonna solve a lot of your problems without, you'll increase your throughput, improve your quality without doing anything with, um, with your technology. Um, measure the basics. That's all it is. I haven't taken you guys down into any slick stuff. This is all basic stuff that we would do in manufacturing or anywhere else. It's just what is going on in the, in the operation. And then ultimately, I can't tell you how true this is, the bottom bullet there. Change happens more effectively when everyone understands what the problems are and what it means to the company. There's your dollars, there's your capacity, there's your maps. Look at your turtle diagrams, look at your spaghetti diagrams. People are gonna laugh. But then ultimately, you're going to come back and say, yeah, you know what? There is a problem here. How do we solve it? Don't worry about the lean tools, Six Sigma tools, or anything else like that. If you just do that, you'll solve all your problems. You'll solve most of your problems, believe it or not. And finally, can't help but put that plug in there. Have someone else come in who is an outsider to take a look at your process. Honestly, that's the best thing you can do. You guys live it, and you're used to seeing different things, and you, you just, you're, you're immune to them. You just ignore them. When someone else will go, that's not right. No, and they say, "Oh, yeah, you're, maybe you are right, and we should we should go change that." So that's really um, that's really it. Right, everyone, any questions? No, bore you all to death. <laughs> all right, guys, thank you very much. <laughs>